Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at an article from page number 14 of the Delhi edition. This article analyzes the changing dynamics of the border dispute between India and China. But before we look at this article, let us talk about the border dispute between the two countries in greater detail. See, this map shows the current status of the border dispute between the two countries. The border dispute between India and China is generally divided into three sectors. We have the western sector, the central sector and the eastern sector. The dispute in the western sector refers to the Aksai Chin dispute and the map is showing us the former state of Jammu and Kashmir which is entirely claimed by India. As we all know, the whole of JNK and Ladakh legally belong to India. But despite this, parts of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh are under the illegal occupation of Pakistan and China. In the late 1940s, Pakistan occupied parts of Jammu and Kashmir, which we refer to as POK, including the Gilgit-Baltistan region. From the 1950s, China has retained illegal control over Aksai Chin, and these claims have been challenged by India, leading to the dispute at Aksai Chin. Over these border disputes involving India and Pakistan and India and China, multiple conflicts have been fought in this region and the ceasefire line between India and Pakistan is referred to as the line of control whereas the ceasefire line between India and China that is in the western sector is referred to as the line of actual control. Then to the north of India's Siachen Glacier we have a strategically important location known as the Shaksgam Valley. The Shaksgam Valley was a part of Pakistan occupied Gilgit Baltistan but in 1963 that is after the Indo-China conflict of 1962, Pakistan leased the Shaksgam Valley illegally to China by signing an agreement. So essentially, an area claimed by India under the illegal occupation of Pakistan was leased illegally to China through a bilateral agreement signed between these two countries. Since then, China has maintained a strong presence in the Shaksgam Valley and both Pakistan and China have jointly executed a number of projects including the proposed China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So this nexus between Pakistan and China has posed a number of legal and diplomatic challenges for India's claims over the region. In the Aksai Chin region, repeated border incursions and clashes have taken place between India and China, including the latest clash that occurred last week at the Panangso Lake, which is located at the line of actual control and marks the de facto boundary between the two countries. Then in the central sector, we have the border between Tibet, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. In this region as well, due to unclear demarcation of the borders between the two countries, repeated border incursions and clashes have taken place between the two sides. Then in the eastern sector, we have disputes along the Sikkim border and the border of Arunachal Pradesh. This border, which is a part of the eastern sector, is referred to as the McMohan Line. Over the years, Multiple disputes and incursions have occurred at the Natula Pass, which is a strategic pass located between Sikkim and Tibet, and it continues to be a hotspot for border tensions between the two countries. Then recently, there was a major military standoff between India and China at the Doklam Plateau, which is located at the tri-junction of India, Bhutan and China. The Doklam dispute, which occurred in 2017, quickly escalated into a major crisis, and it was diffused later only with the intervention of the top political leadership of both the countries. Then since the 1950s, China has rejected the validity of McMohan Line and it has repeatedly claimed the entire state of Arunachal Pradesh, which legally belongs to India, and it even refers to Arunachal Pradesh as Southern Tibet. China is particularly interested in Tawang, which is located over here in Arunachal Pradesh. It is located close to the border between Tibet and Arunachal Pradesh, and China is interested in Tawang mainly because Tawang is home to important Buddhist monasteries which have close connections with Tibetan monasteries. So this was basically an overview of the border dispute between India and China. And now let us take a look at the timeline of important events as far as the border dispute is concerned. See the McMohan line which is considered as the border between Tibet and Arunachal Pradesh traces back its origin to the 1914 Shimla Convention. During this convention, the then Foreign Secretary of British India, Sir Henry McMohan, negotiated a boundary agreement between British India and the then Tibetan Kingdom. 
As per this agreement, the Macmohan Line was agreed to be the official border between Tibet and the northeast of India. So post-independence as well, the Macmohan Line was supposed to be the border between independent India and Tibet. But due to internal political developments in China, this equation was completely altered. See, in 1949, China witnessed a civil war during which the then government of China, that is the Republic of China, was overthrown by the communists and it was replaced by the PRC or the People's Republic of China. The Republic of China got restricted to Taiwan and the communists under the PRC, they established the legitimate government of mainland China. But please remember, at this point, Tibet was still not a sovereign territory of the PRC. So after the PRC overthrew the Republic of China, India was one of the first countries to recognize the legitimacy of the PRC and it established diplomatic relations with PRC in 1950. But during the early years itself, the PRC had territorial ambitions and it went on to annex Tibet in 1950. The forceful annexation of Tibet by the PRC under Mao Zedong sent shockwaves across the Himalayan border and it led India, Nepal and Bhutan to express concern about the territorial ambitions of China. Initially, India even opposed the annexation of Tibet due to its close civilizational and cultural connections. So this opposition and concerns expressed by the Indian government led China to express suspicion over India's interests over Tibet. But in the interest of pursuing friendly diplomatic relations, India clarified that it had no political or territorial ambitions and it came to accept Tibet as an integral part of China. So during the early 1950s, there was a sense of mutual suspicion and as well as a sense of mutual friendship which defined the bilateral relations between India and China. So from the beginning itself, this was a slightly complicated relationship and in 1954, both the countries took a step forward to establish much more cordial relations by signing the Punch Shield Agreement or also known as the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence. But the seeds of suspicion that were sown in the early 1950s led to a major border dispute over the years and it finally resulted in the 1962 war between the two countries. See, immediately after the signing of the Panchil Agreement, the border dispute erupted over the Aksai Chin issue. India published a few maps which showed that Aksai Chin was an integral part of Indian territory. But later, India discovered that China had already built a road through this region and it further cemented its claims over Aksai Chin by including the region as a part of its maps in 1958. So by 1958, it had become clear that both the countries were claiming Aksai Chin and this led to repeated border clashes, border incursions and frequent protests by both the sides. During this period of diplomatic and military standoff itself, China made it very clear that it would never accept the Macmohan line as the border between Tibet and the northeast of India because this line was drawn up at the Shimla Convention of 1914 to which the PRC was never a party to. As we discussed, the Shimla Accord was signed between the government of British India and the Tibetan Kingdom. China's argument is that this convention did not have any participation either from the PRC or from the Indian side. So on these grounds, PRC has always rejected the validity of Macmohan Line even though independent India had accepted the Macmohan Line as the de facto border between Tibet and northeast of India. So by 1959, both the countries were dealing with the Aksai Chin dispute and the dispute over the Macmohan Line. Upon this, the crisis in Tibet laid the foundation for the 1962 conflict between the two sides. Because in 1959, there was an uprising in Tibet led by the Dalai Lama and in response, the PRC used maximum force to crush this rebellion and as a result, the Dalai Lama and his refugees fled to India and as a humanitarian gesture and as well as a strategic move, India decided to accept these Tibetan refugees and it granted them asylum. So this decision of the Indian government to grant asylum to Tibetan refugees further angered PRC and it deepened the suspicion and the dispute between the two sides. So these three factors led to the Indochina conflict of 1962 in which India suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of PRC. At the end of this conflict, Chinese forces had made deep incursions into Indian territory but later the PRC itself declared a unilateral ceasefire and withdrew most of the troops 
except for the troops that had occupied Aksai Chen. So even though the Chinese forces retreated from the Mekbohan line and returned the occupied parts of Arunachal Pradesh back to India after the 1962 conflict, they refused to give up their positions in Aksai Chen. And in fact, China even strengthened its military position in the Aksai Chen region. So since then, the line of actual control has become the de facto boundary between India and China in the Aksai Chen region. And the Mekbohan line has become the de facto boundary in the eastern sector even though its validity has been rejected by China. Then as we discussed, in 1963, Pakistan leased the Shaksham Valley to China which ended up creating a nexus between the two countries to challenge India's claims over JNK. Over the years, both India and China have seen repeated border incursions and clashes across the western sector, the central sector and as well as the eastern sector. In 1967, there was a major border clash between India and China at the Nathula Pass located in Sikkim. Following these clashes, the strategic Nathula Pass was closed by both the countries even though it is a key cultural and trade link between Sikkim and Tibet. The Nathula Pass remained shut for nearly 40 years and it was reopened only in 2006 after bilateral relations had improved between the two sides. Then in 1987, there was another set of border incursions which had affected the diplomatic ties between the two countries. The relationship between the two started improving only from 1988 onwards after Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi paid a visit to China. This visit led to a better understanding of each other's mutual concerns and both the countries built upon this during the 1993 visit of Prime Minister Nasima Rao to China. During this visit, a very important agreement was signed between the two sides that till date provides for a mechanism to maintain peace and tranquility at the line of actual control. Even today, when incursions or clashes occur at the line of actual control, peace and tranquility is maintained through this mechanism which was established in 1993. Then as a follow-up to this, another agreement was signed in 1996 which provides for confidence building measures in the border areas so that mutual trust can be built between the two sides. Under the confidence building measures, frequent interactions are held between the two armed forces and the governments in order to build trust and reduce suspicion so that there is a readily available channel to negotiate whenever border tensions increase between the two sides. But this small progress made in the bilateral relationship suffered a major setback when India tested its nuclear weapons in 1998. Since India's nuclear program has always been designed to counter China's nuclear arsenal, China took the lead role at the United Nations along with the United States to impose sanctions against India and as a result, the bilateral relations between the two suffered. But from 2000 onwards, as India and China started to emerge as the world's fastest growing economies, both the countries took steps to improve the bilateral relationship. But despite this improvement in relationship, the border dispute has existed parallelly and it continues to affect the bilateral relationship. Post-2000, military confidence building measures were increased through joint military exercises and the frequency of high-level political visits were also increased to build mutual trust. Then in 2001, both the countries exchanged maps in order to clarify each other's position with regard to the line of actual control. This had cleared a lot of confusion related to the demarcation of the LAC and it had considerably brought down incidents of border incursions from both the sides. Then in 2003, following Vajpayee's visit to China, for the first time, the PRC recognized Sikkim to be an integral part of India. This was China's reciprocation to India's recognition of the One China policy. This is one of the reasons why India has officially stayed away from China's internal political unrest seen in Taiwan, Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong. But in return, even though China recognized Sikkim as an integral part of India, it has repeatedly rejected the validity of Mekmohan line and over the years, it has adopted a very aggressive strategy with regard to the Aksai Chin dispute. Apart from this, China has betrayed India's trust by repeatedly supporting Pakistan's claims either directly or indirectly over Jammu and Kashmir. So these confusing policies of China has made the bilateral relationship a very complicated relationship and at the center of this complication lies the border dispute. But in 2005 there was a major breakthrough when both the countries signed the Strategic and Cooperative Partnership Agreement. Under this agreement, the bilateral relationship was elevated to the strategic level 
and both the countries established the special representative mechanism or also known as the SR mechanism in order to negotiate the border dispute and work out a political solution in order to resolve the border dispute. Under this SR mechanism, India's National Security Advisor has repeatedly met with his Chinese counterpart in order to work out a political settlement for the border dispute. Between 2005 and 2016, the SR mechanism was making some progress. But due to repeated breach of trust by the Chinese side, the SR mechanism has today come to a standstill. During this period, the negotiations under the SR mechanism was first disrupted by the Chinese side when repeated border incursions took place between 2010 and 2011. But after the resolution of these tensions, the SR mechanism talks had resumed. But it was again disrupted in 2017 with the emergence of the Doklam dispute. Tensions related to the Doklam dispute were resolved thanks to the informal Wuhan summit between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping. The relationship was moving forward as a result of the follow-up informal summit at Mamlapuram which was held last year. But China has again disrupted the relationship by displaying unnecessary aggression that has led to border clashes over the last few days in the Ladakh sector and as well as in the Sikkim sector. These border clashes come at a time when the world is battling a pandemic and it is in line with the military aggression that China has been displaying in the South China Sea as well. So this brings us back to this article on page number 14, which analyzes the changing dynamics in India and China, which could be responsible for these rising incidents of border tensions between the two sides. According to this article, India's increased military capabilities at the border, accompanied with China's increasing assertiveness, has contributed to this increase in border tensions. See, historically, China has always enjoyed an advantageous position with regard to the Indo-China border. China has enjoyed the advantage of friendly terrain. It has always built up better infrastructure than India at the border areas. It has better logistics available at the border. And as a result, China has managed to deploy more troops and equipment, which has always given China a comfortable advantage over India. But over the last 15 years, India has adopted a modernization drive along the Indo-China border and it has adopted a more forward position by deploying more troops and equipment and by building strategic infrastructure along the border areas. For example, by December 2022, India plans to complete all the 61 strategic roads that it has been building along the Indo-China border, which are spread across Arunachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Sikkim, Ladakh, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, etc. So the creation of such border infrastructure strengthens India's logistical capabilities to deploy more troops and equipment at a short notice. This increasing military capabilities of India at the border has led to more assertiveness from China and it has responded by increasing the frequency and the depth of border patrols. Since both the sides have a different perception of the actual border, both at the LAC and the McMohan line, this increase in border patrols from both India and China results in more possibilities of incursions, confrontations and clashes. While these clashes are generally minor clashes that happen at the local level, they do have the potential to escalate and result in a major diplomatic and military crisis between the two sides. So in order to prevent such an escalation, there are protocols that have been put in place by both the sides. For example, under the 2005 Strategic Partnership Agreement, a protocol was laid down in order to prevent such border escalations. As per this protocol, new confidence-building measures have been implemented at the border areas and it commits both the countries to not use force or threaten to use force whenever there is a border incursion or a border confrontation. Then in 2013, both the sides signed the Border Defence Cooperation Agreement according to which the border patrol party of one country shall not follow or tail the patrols of the other side, especially in areas where there is no common understanding of the LAC. Under this agreement, the local troops have been mandated to exercise maximum restraint and refrain from any provocative action or from using force against the other side. But despite these laid down protocols and procedures, clashes keep occurring between both the sides, similar to the ones that took place a couple of weeks ago at the Panongso Lake and at the Nakula Pass. As a result of this increased aggression of China along the Indo-China border, few strategic experts believe that this is a deliberate strategy of China to exploit the pandemic. They argue that this is a geopolitical move of China to assert its claims in an aggressive manner during the pandemic 
because similar trends have been noted with regard to China's military aggression in the South China Sea as well. These experts also believe that increased aggression of China along the Indochina border is a response to India's restriction of FDI from China. India recently restricted the flow of FDI from neighboring countries including China in order to prevent any hostile takeover of Indian companies which are going through an economic crisis as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown. But this argument is countered by other strategic experts and by former Indian ambassadors to China and they believe that there is no geopolitical angle to these incidents and these clashes are most likely a result of local dynamics at the ground level. That is differing perceptions over LAC and McMohan line could result in the border patrols of either side crossing over into the other side and according to these experts this could be the reason behind increasing incidents of border incursions and border conflicts between the two sides. But either ways increased military capabilities of India and the increasing aggression of China along the border threatens to disrupt peace and stability along the border because even these minor clashes have the potential to escalate and explode into a major crisis. Next we have a related column on page number 6 which is written by Mr. Vijay Gokhale who recently retired as India's foreign secretary. In this column he explains the changing nature of Chinese diplomacy. He explains how the PRC under the leadership of Zhu Enlai and Deng Xiaoping had adopted a strategy of persuasion and compromise while dealing with international diplomacy and conflict resolution. But in contrast the PRC under the leadership of Xi Jinping has adopted a more aggressive and unilateral approach towards geopolitics and this changing nature of Chinese diplomacy poses a threat to global peace and stability. Even though this column is not directly relevant for our exams, I would request you to go through this column once as it provides a good insight into China's diplomatic strategies that could help you in your mains answer writing. Now let's take up another column from page number 6 which explains the Pakistan paradox. The paradox is that Pakistan is not just a state sponsorer of terrorism but also a victim of terrorism. To understand this paradox and to understand this argument being made by the author, we need to look at the complicated history that Pakistan has had with radicalism and terrorism. See over the last 35 to 40 years, Pakistan has deliberately promoted radicalism and terrorism in its society and as well as in its neighborhood as a part of its state policy. Pakistan embraced radicalism and terrorism as a part of its state policy in order to wage proxy wars against its enemies so as to push forward its geopolitical goals and protect its national interests. It is ironical that Pakistan has supported radicalization of its own society and it has nurtured various terror outfits in the region in order to achieve its geopolitical interests. But today this very same strategy is coming back to bite Pakistan. See Pakistan has been waging a proxy war against India since many decades as it sees India as its enemy number one. Immediately after independence, Pakistan supported tribal militias in order to occupy parts of Jammu and Kashmir as a part of its first proxy war against India. Then through the 1960s and 1970s, Pakistan has been known to have supported a number of India-based outfits such as the Naxals, few Northeast insurgent groups etc. But Pakistan's first major entry into religion-based proxy war was in Afghanistan in the 1980s. This was a period when the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan and had occupied Afghanistan. Since this was the Cold War era, the United States decided to make use of this opportunity and in collaboration with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, they created the Afghan Mujahideen in order to challenge the Soviet invasion. In this proxy war of the United States, Pakistan played a key role. While the money and the weapons were coming in from the US and Saudi Arabia, it was Pakistan which played the key role in training and arming the Afghan Mujahideen as a form of resistance against the Soviet Union. During this period, Pakistan emerged as a key ally of the United States and other countries and it started receiving huge sums of money as funding and as well as a large supply of weapons. And since Pakistan was being seen as a key ally of these countries, it conveniently started diverting a part of this money and these weapons to wage a religion-based proxy war against India by establishing a number of anti-India terror outfits. Initially, Pakistan experimented by supporting the Khalistan movement. Then later, the Pakistani army and its ISI 
played a key role in supporting insurgency in Kashmir by establishing various anti-India terror outfits such as the Hizbul Mujahideen, the Lashkar-e-Taiba and later the Jaish-e-Mohammed. In order to create a ready pool of recruits for these terror organizations, Pakistan deliberately supported the radicalization of its own society. From the 1970s till date, the support given by the Pakistani state to radicalism and extremism has ended up creating a deep divide within its own society. This has led to the rise of radical forms of Islam such as Salafism, Wahhabism and this has ended up affecting the minority communities of Pakistan including Muslim minorities such as Shias, Sufis, Ahmadiyyas, Hazaras, Barelvis etc. Over the years, Pakistan's dependency on proxy wars as a state policy and deliberate misinterpretation of religion in order to promote radicalization and extremism has ended up giving birth to a number of terror groups that are today targeting the Pakistani state itself. This has led Pakistan to create a distinction between good terrorism and bad terrorism. Pakistan treats outfits such as the Taliban, the Haqqani network, the Lashkar and the Jesh as good terror outfits as they help Pakistan achieve its geopolitical goals. For example, the Taliban has made Pakistan relevant in Afghanistan and in global geopolitics. The Lashkar and the Jesh help Pakistan to push its Kashmir agenda against India. So for this reason, Pakistan has not only tolerated these outfits, it has even supported them, nurtured them and protected them and this makes Pakistan one of the key state sponsors of terrorism. But this flawed and dangerous strategy of Pakistan has also given birth to other terror outfits such as the TTP or the Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan which has repeatedly targeted the Pakistani army, the Pakistani government and as well as the minority communities. So such terror outfits and such radical outfits which have turned against the state of Pakistan itself only they have been labelled as the bad terror outfits. So it is this paradox of Pakistan that the writer is trying to explain and it shows how Pakistan is not just a state sponsor of terrorism but it has also become a victim of terrorism because its investments in terrorism and radicalization has ended up creating a Frankenstein monster that the Pakistani state is no longer able to control and this has come back to affect the stability of the Pakistani state itself. Now let's take up the next article. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has said that the COVID-19 pandemic is unlikely to affect drug trafficking and the supply of drugs. The UN agency has brought out its report Synthetic Drugs in East and Southeast Asia in which it analyzes the trafficking routes and the impact of the pandemic on the supply of drugs. See the pandemic has resulted in the imposition of lockdowns around the world and as a result international borders have been closed, airports have been closed as well and a number of airlines have been cancelled. So this disruption in connectivity and trans-border movement is likely to affect the supply and trafficking of drugs. So as a result, the UN agency expects there to be a temporary reduction in the availability of drugs. But these restrictions are unlikely to have a medium to long term effect because drug traffickers and organized criminal groups, they are not entirely dependent on these globalized supply chains. See if you look at drug trafficking, there are three major global hubs for production and supply. The first one is the Golden Crescent region that roughly covers Afghanistan and Pakistan. Next we have the Golden Triangle region which is a part of the lower Mekong Delta located at the tri-junction of Myanmar, Laos and Thailand. And the third hub for drugs production and trafficking is located in Latin America and North America that is centered around Colombia and Mexico. The drug cartels and drug traffickers that are operating out of these hubs they are not entirely dependent on globalized supply chains and especially the supply of synthetic drugs such as meth and even opium based drugs can easily continue because these drug cartels and the traffickers they know very well how to exploit the porous borders and how to establish alternative routes. So in this context the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime has warned that the pandemic is unlikely to result in a reduction in the supply and production of drugs and hence it is absolutely essential for national governments around the world to carefully observe the trends that are going to emerge with regard to supply and trafficking of drugs. Now let's take up an article from page number 10 
which helps us understand the collaboration between India and United States in their joint effort to battle the COVID-19 pandemic. See, both the countries are working together to jointly develop a vaccine for COVID-19 under the Vaccine Action Program. This Indo-US Vaccine Action Program is a 33-year-old collaboration between the two countries. Under this collaboration, various research institutions of both the countries are involved. It includes the National Institute of Health from the United States and from India, it includes the Department of Biotechnology and the Indian Council of Medical Research. So through this vaccine action program, both the countries are jointly working towards developing a vaccine for COVID-19 and they are also planning to jointly test the vaccine candidates as a part of the clinical trials. Then over the last few days, we have already discussed that USAID, which is a funding agency of the US government that provides for developmental assistance in other countries, is looking to donate 200 ventilators to India in order to strengthen India's efforts against the COVID-19 pandemic. This donation of 200 ventilators from USAID has been personally approved by the US President as a gesture of gratitude for India's exports of hydroxychloroquine to the United States. Then the Center for Disease Control of the United States has also pledged to donate around $3.6 million to Indian research institutions that are involved in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. But this proposed funding is currently stuck as it is awaiting approval from the Ministry of Home Affairs because the CDC has been placed on the watch list of Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Now let's take up an article from page number 11. According to meteorologists and atmospheric scientists, hotter seas and oceans promote the formation of supercyclones. A recent study conducted on the formation of Cyclone Umfan that is currently headed towards the coast of West Bengal and Odisha has shown that warmer seas and oceans feed the formation of a supercyclone. And the study has also shown that the lockdown might have indirectly affected the formation of supercyclone by increasing the surface temperature of the Bay of Bengal. See, if you have studied about the formation of cyclones, you would know that the energy for a cyclone comes from the constant supply of moisture. Basically, for cyclones to sustain and to build energy, there has to be a constant feed of moisture from the water. This constant supply of moisture will exist only when the water below is warm enough and as a result of climate change and global warming, the heating up of seas and oceans have become a common phenomena. So according to this study, climate change and global warming are responsible for increasing the surface temperature of water and this results in greater evaporation, providing greater moisture supply to the cyclones that have formed over water. So when the constant supply of moisture is ensured, this will help turn the cyclone into a super cyclone. According to scientists who were a part of the study, a record temperature has been noted in the Bay of Bengal and in the first and second week of May, a maximum surface temperature of around 32 to 34 degrees Celsius has been noted, which is way above normal. The study has also shown that Cyclone Umfan evolved from a Category 1 cyclone to Category 5 cyclone in just a matter of 18 hours. This unusual increase in the intensity of the cyclone and its eventual transformation into a super cyclone has been attributed to two factors. The first one is of course climate change and global warming and second is the indirect impact of the lockdown. As we discussed, climate change and global warming directly contributes to warmer waters and as a result increases the availability of moisture which will sustain and energize the cyclones. But scientists suspect that the lockdown might have had an indirect impact because the closure of industries, factories and transportation has reduced PM emissions or particulate matter emissions. See particulate matter such as black carbon, they are basically aerosols that are found in the atmosphere. And such aerosols have the ability to reflect sunlight and reduce heating of the surface water. So due to reduced air pollution, the concentration of PM levels has gone down. And this could be one of the reasons why abnormal heating of the waters of Bay of Bengal has been recorded. Then it is also a known fact that particulate matter which would have been dissolved in water is known to have an impact on the formation of clouds. Under regular conditions, a lot of particulate matter would be transported from the Indo-Gangetic plain into the Bay of Bengal. During regular conditions, the greater availability of particulate matter would introduce more aerosols into the atmosphere which will help in the formation of clouds. But as a result of lockdown, the PM emissions have gone down and hence fewer aerosols are available 
which has affected the formation of clouds as well. And as you know, clouds have a very high albedo, that is their ability to reflect sunlight is very high. And as a result, when the formation of clouds is more, it helps in keeping the water a little cooler and this would restrict the constant supply of moisture to the cyclone. During this study, scientists have recorded an abnormal increase in the surface temperature of Bay of Bengal during the months of March and April and the recorded temperature was at least 1 to 3 degrees Celsius higher than average. Scientists are attributing this higher than normal temperature to two factors that is climate change and the indirect impact of the lockdown. Now let's take up the practice questions. Which of the following statements are correct? A Trojan horse is a computer malware which misleads the user of its true intent. They are generally spread by some form of social engineering. For example, where a user is duped into executing an email attachment disguised to appear not suspicious. Unlike computer viruses or worms, Trojans generally do not attempt to inject themselves into other files or otherwise propagate themselves. All the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. See, a Trojan horse is a type of a computer malware. Malware stands for malicious software. This name is taken from a popular story in Greek mythology. According to the story, the Greeks had used a wooden horse known as Trojan horse to infiltrate and defeat the city of Troy. Basically, the city of Troy was misled and deceived by the Trojan horse. Similarly, the Trojan horse malware is basically a program or a software which will mislead the user of its true intent. It will deceive the user to make them believe that it is not a suspicious software by making use of social engineering techniques such as phishing. See, phishing is a hacking technique that makes use of social engineering to make the target believe that they have received a mail from a genuine source. These social engineering techniques are designed to make the target believe that they have received a mail or a message from a trusted source and it is designed to trick them into clicking on these links. In case of a regular phishing attack, the moment they click on the link, it will lead them to a suspicious website where an attempt is made to convince the target to reveal his personal details and banking information. But in case of an attack using a Trojan horse malware, the target is tricked using social engineering techniques to download an attachment and execute a program which will end up installing the malware on the target system. Once installed, the malware can take over the computer and it can compromise sensitive details such as banking information of the user which might be stored on the computer. And another feature of a Trojan horse malware is that, unlike computer viruses or computer worms, a Trojan does not usually replicate itself. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which organization acts as India's nodal agency for correspondence and liaison with Interpol? The correct answer is option B. It is the Central Bureau of Investigation or CBI which is the nodal agency for corresponding with Interpol. These two questions were asked because according to this article on page number 8, the Central Bureau of Investigation has notified all central agencies, state governments and union territories regarding a Trojan malware that has been circulating, which is known as Cerebrus, which has been designed to extract banking related information by exploiting people's interest in reading about COVID-19 content. This alert has been issued by the CBI based on inputs received from Interpol. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? Olive Ridley turtles have been listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. They are found only in the warm and tropical waters of the Indian Ocean. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect. So option A is the right answer. See, Olive Ridley turtles are found in warm and tropical waters. But not just in the Indian Ocean, they can also be found in the Pacific Ocean and as well as in the Atlantic Ocean. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 16, the mass hatching phenomena of Olive Ridley turtles has been completed for this season. To understand the topic of Olive Ridley turtles in detail and to understand the mass nesting and mass hatching phenomena, kindly go back and watch our analysis for the 24th of Feb. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. Mission Indra Dhanush, launched by the Government of India, pertains to immunization of children and pregnant women. Option A is the right answer. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, India and China 
share a complicated history of border tensions. Of late, tensions have increased frequently due to change dynamics at the border. Evaluate. The second question, Pakistan has sponsored a variety of terror groups to serve its geopolitical interests. But this approach of Pakistan has made it both a perpetrator of terror and as well as a victim. Discuss. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.